Good morning, everybody, and Merry Christmas. Let's worship the Lord together. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we were made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church and we need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. Refuse to waste our lives. For you're our joy and prize To see the captive's hearts release The hurt, the sick, the poor at peace We lay down our lives for heaven's cause We are your church And we pray revive this earth Build your kingdom let the darkness fear show your mighty hand heal our streets and land set your church on fire win this nation back change the atmosphere build your kingdom This week, we light the prophet's candle, which promises a savior messiah, a servant king. The prophet Isaiah to the house of David promised a sign. Behold, a virgin will bear a son, and he will be called Emmanuel. The prophet Micah to the little town of Bethlehem promised a sign. From you, the Lord will bring a ruler for Israel. He is from long ago, from eternity and he will be our peace. The Virgin Mary came with her husband to Bethlehem in order to register for the census. In Bethlehem, these prophecies were fulfilled as the time came for the Virgin to give birth to her son. The Christ child is the promised Emmanuel, the Eternal One, the Prince of Peace.
Good morning, church, and Merry Christmas. This is the week in which we commemorate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God who is with God and who is God, the Word who speaks life into our existence, and the Word who reveals the mystery of our salvation. And so, as we focus this week on the birth of Christ, we bring to conclusion our Advent series, which focuses on the prologue of the Gospel of John. And today we're going to look at three key verses in that prologue, verses 14, 16, and 17. And this is what the Bible says. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only begotten one from the Father, full of grace and truth. And verse 16, from his fullness we have received grace upon grace, for the law was delivered through Moses, but Jesus Christ has delivered grace and truth. And what I want to focus on is that key phrase, full of grace and truth. And those three terms are repeated terms for John. He wants us to focus on the fullness of Jesus, the fullness which is expressed in grace and truth. And so the first thing that we want to look at is the fullness of the word. That phrase, full of grace and truth, is an echo from Exodus. And we discussed this a bit last week, but uh, if you haven't seen that already, I wanted to just uh, reiterate, repetition is good for our learning, uh, what happened there. So in the Exodus story, Moses goes to the mountain, and on the mountain he meets with God and receives the law, the Ten Commandments. Now, in chapter 33, Moses makes a request to God, saying, I pray that I might see your glory. And God explains to Moses that no one can see the glory of God and survive. And so, in order to uh, answer Moses' prayer, he comes down on the mountain, descending in the cloud of glory, and Moses is placed in a crevice in the rock face, and God puts his hand over Moses. And then he allows his glory to pass in front of Moses. But because Moses can't see, God speaks in self-disclosure. In Exodus 34, verses 5 and 6, God says this, The Lord, the Lord God, who is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. And that phrase, abounding in loving kindness and truth, is the Hebrew version that stands behind what John expresses in the fullness of grace and truth. So, um, what I want to show you is that when the glory of God passes in front of Moses, he, it, it's a self-expression. And that abounding in loving kindness or steadfast love and truth um, is pointing to the character of who God is. And the term for loving kindness in Hebrew is hesed. 
And hesed is a very difficult word for us to translate because it's a word that we, that we would use several words to translate because there's some nuances with that word. Um, it's not just that God is good and kind. That's part of it, that there's this kindness. But it extends past that to a, a love that is enduring and merciful. And so in some translations, you'll see it uh, translated as um, his steadfast love or his enduring mercy or his loving kindness. And all of them are trying to get at this character of God, which is the covenant love. And that covenant love is not something that uh, we as human beings are super familiar with because most of our relationships are contractual. We have this mentality in our life that you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. You hold up your side of the bargain, I'll uphold mine. And when someone fails us, then it breaks the relationship and we're no longer in good relationship with you with that person. That's contractual relationship. But covenant love points to something deeper. It's like the parental love. Think of it as our heavenly father loving us even when we don't do things well. It's like the kind of love that a mother has for a child that even though they mess up, that mother will extend grace again and again in order to correct and to build up that child and, and is dedicated to that child. So even in the situations um, where there's failure or where, there's, uh, where the child doesn't hold up their end of the bargain, they don't respect, they become rebellious, the mother's love never stops. And so that's what Hesed is, it's that, that enduring, steadfast love that has mercy upon mercy because the commitment to the other remains. And so what we have in Hesed is the character of God. God is, in fact, love. The character of God expressed in graciousness and compassion. And so um, John will say that he's filled with grace. And then the second word, truth, in Hebrew is emet. And emet is... Um, is also a, a characteristic of God. It's part of his nature. His nature is genuine and true and dependable and trustworthy. And so in some translations, instead of truth, we render, et, we render, we render that word as faithfulness. Because we know that um, just as God is all loving, that he's omnibenevolent and good towards us in every way. He is, um, has a genuine character that is true and faithful, that is unchanging yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so what we have when John says he's from the Father, full of grace and truth, means he's saying that the full measure of God's nature, God's character, is in Jesus and his char God's character is expressed through the word, Jesus Christ, with grace and truth. Now, Paul talks about Jesus in a very similar way in the book of Colossians, chapter 2, verse 9. Paul says that the fullness of deity dwelled in him in bodily form. So that same term for fullness, that the fullness of God dwells in Jesus in bodily form. And so what both Paul and John are expressing is that the, that abundance, that overflowing of God is full in Jesus and overflows to us. And that's why verse 16 is so important. John says, from his fullness, we, those who believe in his name, we have all received grace upon grace. And so I wanna move from that idea of fullness that's overflowing in abundance to this idea of grace. 
And of course, as I've already expressed, grace, grace has its foundation, its origin in the character of God, in that hesed, in that loving cov covenant. But what we are looking at grace upon grace is how that graciousness, how that grace of God is delivered as a gift unto us. So there's a pretty interesting uh, little contraction in Greek, anti, which stands between grace and grace. And there's some ambiguity in how that word can be translated. In fact, there's two pretty possible ways that you can think of it. One is grace for grace, which is like a replacing. One grace for another kind of grace. And so here we're talking about the quality of grace. One kind of grace replacing another kind of grace. So when we think about grace in, in that way, um, it fits the context because we have Moses who delivers the Torah, the law, the instruction of God. There's a certain grace in the delivering of God's instruction. Uh, my daughter Amara memorized a verse uh, this week, Psalm uh, the 119 verse five. And that Psalm says that your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And what that means is that the word of God is a light that directs us, that shows us the way that we should go, to show us God's intended purpose for our life. If we abide in the Torah law, then we learn what we shouldn't do and what we should avoid. And we also learn what we should do and how we should go forward. We learn how to please God and how to live at peace with one another. And as we follow the commands of the Lord, his word, we enter into a right way of life. And so if we're talking about grace instead of grace, we have the general grace that is the instruction for life to let us know when we have failed, to let us know that we have sin, to let us know the right way to go and how to please God. Um, but there's a grace that comes in Jesus delivering uh, grace and truth, which is of another kind. So let's say that you've been following the word and you've failed, you've gone this way or that way off of the path, that you've, that you've gotten yourself so lost. I, I think of a situation where when you get in the back roads or you get off the road and, and, you're, and you're hiking or something like that, and you try to do a GPS from there, and it's almost like the, the phone doesn't know how to send you where you're supposed to go. There's a way that it says, it just says, return to the root. It doesn't tell you how to get to the root. It's like, you can't get there from here. You've got to get somewhere else before I can even get you directions. We can get ourselves so lost that instead of direction, what we need is rescue. And so one way of thinking about it is grace upon grace is a, a new grace, a new covenant through Jesus Christ, which in essence is of a different or better quality than the grace that we had before. And one of the reasons that I am attracted to this way of reading is that it tells me that there's a specific, focused, intentional grace that God delivers to us. You know, there's, there may be different kinds of grace. So the grace that are rebellious child might need is to be caught right at the beginning before they get into too much trouble. And in that, there's a certain kind of grace that is needed for a rebellious child. There may be a grace of getting a good mentor in that kind of a situation. But if someone is sick and they're enduring chronic pain, there's another kind of grace that they would need, not to be directed, but a grace to be upheld, to be strengthened. And even as you have people who are caring for those who are, who are sick, they need a certain kind of grace that helps them endure as caretakers. And then there's the time of grief. And that's another kind of grace. 
a grace of mercy and comfort that sustains that the nearness of God is, is critical. To be comforted is more important to be strengthened. And so we have these different, there's a way of thinking about different ways that grace is expressed in our life. And if we say grace, one grace for another grace, one of the things that it says about God is that he meets our very needs in his graciousness. This is one of the things I love about the book of John, by the way. In the Old Testament, in the time of Moses, God identifies himself as I am that I am. I am that I am. He is the great I am. But when Jesus speaks, he uses a predicate for each of those I ams. So for the hungry, I am the bread of life. For the thirsty, I am the living water. For those who are withering up and spiritually dead, he says, I am the life and the resurrection, and I am the vine for the branches. And so Jesus, as we read through John, we will see that Jesus is the answer for every human need. And so it's just really beautiful to think of a specific grace directed for your specific need. But there's something divine about the ambiguity in that term because the other way to read it is grace upon grace. And so now instead of talking about a, a difference of quality, we're talking about a quantity, an increase. Blessing upon blessing. So even as we might think of having a general grace and then a specific grace, that's, it's one that's built upon another so that we are blessed beyond measure, so that the fullness of God's uh, loving kindness is expressed upon grace, upon grace, upon grace. His love endures forever, has no end. He is always merciful, compassionate, and gracious to us. And in Jesus Christ, we see the fullness of his grace, that he loves us so much that he gave his one and only son, that whoever might believe in him would have life and have it everlasting. And so in Jesus we find the fullness of God's character expressed in the fullness of grace. Here's one way that I like to think about it, like the 23rd Psalm. The psalmist says there that you have prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil and my cup overflows so that surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That idea of an overflowing, an abundance of grace. That surely goodness and mercy, I can depend on the Lord for goodness and mercy all the days of my life and I will be with him in his house forever. That's grace. And then the last term that we wanna look at is truth. And so truth also has its root in the character of God. Truth has its root in that unchangeable reality of the person of God. It's not something arbitrary. It's not something that we can invent. There's no uh, philosophy of relativity. You know, we always in our context try to think of what's good for you, what's good for me, what's true for you, what's true for me. What John is expressing is that the character of God in, in its genuineness, the reality of who God is, the unchanging, dependable, trustworthy character of God is expressed in a truth that is absolute. You don't invent it. You only learn it. You only see who he is. And so Jesus is the expression of the true character, the reality of Almighty God. And truth becomes an idea that John will pick up throughout the gospel. And I think one of the real critical points is in chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, 
where Jesus says this to those who are believing in him. He says, if you abide, if you remain in my word, you are my true disciples. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I love verse 32. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free because I think that one of the main reasons that we mess up our lives is because we have, uh, we lie to ourselves, we, we deceive ourselves, we tell ourselves untruths. These lies limit us. So uh, one of the things that we, we talk about this in psychology is that there's self-fulfilling prophecies that people have. So if someone says, I'm not lovable, no one will love me, I'll never find love. As you keep telling yourself those lies, then it limits your ability to have meaningful relationships. If you say, I'm not smart, I'm not intelligent, I don't know how to succeed, then you'll find the self-fulfilling prophecy that you will not be successful. So these lies limit you and in a way captivate or bind you. And so uh, one really good example is the workaholic. Because a workaholic has a lie. And that lie is that um, my success depends on my effort. My family's provisions depend on my good work ethic. And so they, the, the workaholic believes that their paycheck depends on their work, that they are their, their own provider, that they provide for their family. But the liberating truth is that God is the provider. So here's how that works out. The workaholic will spend so much time working that they'll work Sundays and not go to church. They'll work when they should be spending time with family. They'll work when they should be taking time to rest. And so what ends up happening is the thing that they try to provide for their family starts to fail. Their children don't know them. Their family doesn't stay connected to the body of Christ, to the church. They wear themselves out and the family falls apart. But if they understand that God is the provider and they are not, then the time they take raising their children, living out their purpose as husband, living out their purpose as father, living out their purpose in their work, all are equally important as a calling from the Lord. So they work as as unto the Lord, they work in service to the Lord, not working as a slave in order to get money, but working in a balanced way to have a life that honors God. And then they can understand that the provision that comes from that, the blessing that comes from that isn't of their own doing, but from God. So it's a different understanding of work in general, that you honor God first. And only one of the ways that you honor God is through the work. It is not the thing that sustains you. But Jesus takes that further. He says, In chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus self-identifies that Edmund character of God, that, that genuineness, I am the truth. I am the liberating truth for all the falsehoods and lies out there. If you know the truth, Jesus Christ, then you will be free and you will be free indeed. How do we spon- how should we respond to this part of the prologue of John, this truth that Jesus uh, has in his being the fullness of God's character that is delivered unto us, 
that he has delivered grace and truth. How do we respond to his genuine character and his covenant love? I think it's no accident that Christmas and New Year's are so close together because Christmas is that annual reminder that we really need Jesus. We really need to get our priorities straight. And New Year's is a time that we make resolutions of how we're gonna live different. I would ask you, as you respond to Jesus today, to make him the centerpiece. Just like in our Advent candles, as we light those candles, and in a few minutes we light the Christ candle, that Christ is the center of all that we do. I think there's three practical words that I want to leave with you. One, how do you remain in the word? How do you remain in him? Listen. You have to listen to hear the word of God. Listen to what he's teaching. Listen to the way he lives. Listen to his direction. Second, learn. Learn who he is. Learn his priorities. Learn his way of life. So you listen and you learn. And the third thing is to live it out. It's not obedience until you do it. You haven't heard until you put it into practice. My prayer is that as you resolve to live differently this next year, as you make your New Year's resolution, the first one would be focused on Jesus. How might your goals be different if you have a goal to listen to the Lord, to learn from the Lord, and to live your life out in honor of him? Let's pray. Thank you, God, for this Advent season that returns our heart again to our Savior, Jesus Christ. And as our prayer today, that we don't just witness the glory of God coming in the flesh, but that we respond, that we might know the truth, and that the truth of Jesus Christ might set us free. Amen.
candles of Advent, the Torah, Zion, Kingdom, and Prophet's candle. This week we're also going to light the final candle, the Christ candle, which marks the arrival of King Jesus. The angel Gabriel said to the Virgin Mary, do not be afraid, you have found favor with God. You will give birth to a son, call him Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high God. The angel Gabriel to Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Her child is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call him Jesus, and Jesus will save his people from their sins. And now, let me bless you and send you. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Hey, church, you are sent. <laughs>